Okay, so next up, we're going to have a urologist, and guess what he's going to speak to you about? No, he's not going to talk to you about your brain or your feet. He's going to talk about that, uh, that desire that you often get to have to get up and run, right? Well, you don't know if you're going to make it from one end of town to the next. So my name is Chris Walker. I'm a urogynecologist. And so you must be saying to yourselves, what on earth is a urogynecologist? Well, there are only about four of us in town in Orlando. And simply put, urogynecology is a fusion of female urology with gynecology, thus urogynecology. We are, my office is based in downtown Orlando, and um, Stuart asked for me to give you a brief chat regarding what we do. We take care of anything gynecologically related from a simple annual visit to the more complicated subspecialty work related to female incontinence. So, without any further ado, let me just briefly chat with you. The first set of slides, I'm not going to bore you all with those um, beginning slides because you all are very, very familiar with multiple sclerosis. Those are really geared for my students. So, we all know what multiple sclerosis is. It's a disease pertaining to the white matter in the brain. And we all know that those lesions, in these lesions you have a defect related to the myelin. The symptoms that we are really concerned with in my world is related to the bladder as well as bowel function. So in terms of the prevalence, we really see that in America you are seeing roughly about 400,000 people with this horrific diagnosis, and mainly women are affected with this. We see that the ratio is roughly a three to one ratio. And in our office, obviously we deal, deal with only ladies, but also some of the other benign patients who come in, we actually had a diagnosis recently, her spouse has MS. The roughly, it's about 10,000 new cases a year, and the prevalence is roughly one in 100,000. In terms of what happens, I'm not going to bore you with the details. You can clearly see what happens in the healthy nerve versus the damaged nerve. Now, in terms of those folks who are affected with this disease and this diagnosis, roughly 20, I would say roughly two thirds have some issue related to the bladder. That may be something that you may be thinking is normal i.e. urinary urgency frequency, getting up at night to go to the restroom. I don't want my patients getting up more than once or twice at night. It's not normal for you to be going often. I see someone in the audience laughing, and I can see that, you know, obviously there's an issue there. And so my goal is, and our goal as providers, is to really address that situation and remind you, first of all, it is not normal. There is therapy out there ranging from conservative therapy to the more aggressive forms of therapy to address this. I would say roughly 50% of patients will also mention that there is some form of urinary incontinence. And ladies are, un you know, ladies are affected with this condition more so than men. Now, it's not only the bladder that's affected, and I'll briefly gloss over why. I'm not going to bore you with the nerve tracts and the whole neuro, path, neuro pathways, but what I will say is that roughly 15% of patients will say that they do have daily forms of fecal incontinence. Certainly, I would say roughly two-thirds will say there is some form of bowel dysfunction, and that dysfunction may range from being uh, having constipation to having some form of mild fecal smearing or fecal impaction. So... Here we see some of the effects of, these, uh, uh, of the diagnosis. I'm not going to put you, this up too long on the screen because you all are eating. Now, <laughs> and it seems to be a very good lunch. Thanks, Stuart. So in terms of the emotional impact, we as healthcare providers really have to take this diagnosis seriously. And our group really um, accept this as an honor to take care of patients who have this diagnosis. Um, you know, 
first of all, our office is geared for patients with a diagnosis beginning at the, um, in the parking garage, it's ADA accessible to the rooms that have specialized beds to deal with this entity and this diagnosis. We really focus on not the diagnosis in a, uh, with blinders on, but we also realize that there is an emotional component to things. It affects patients in terms of their ability to function at work, exercise, being able to train, being able to run, those are aspects that they are now being impacting, it's impacting their quality of life. And of course, if your quality of life is being affected, obviously you're gonna have the diagnosis of having anxiety and depression. And we work in tandem with your primary provider, i.e. your neurologist, who always takes the lead. We are there as subspecialists to offer suggestions and to support the primary team. So one of the things with us as providers, we never jump to the conclusions. When we get a referral of a patient with MS, we sit down and do a detailed history. Because the first thing is that when we have our students, they are rushing to go straight to the MS diagnosis. However, we have to remember that there are many other comorbidities that can result in urinary incontinence. We talk about parity. You may say, what the devil is parity? That really relates to ladies who, it, really relates to how many pregnancies have you had. We know that the more pregnancies that a woman has had, especially a vaginal birth, then there is statistically higher chances of her having injury to the pelvic floor. And by that I mean injury to the muscles as well as the nerves in that delicate area, i.e. the pelvis. Because of that, we know that statistically one in three women who have had a vaginal childbirth will have some form of injury. So I'm not saying that every woman is gonna have an injury, but we know that statistically roughly one in three, once you have had a childbirth, vaginally, there may be complications related to that simply because of the passage of a very firm mass, i.e. the baby, through a very delicate area, muscles and nerves get damaged. So we as providers take into consideration the fact that the more pregnancies a patient has had, then obviously the more chances she may have to have neurological sequelae resulting in urinary urgency frequency, nocturia, meaning you go into the bathroom a lot at night, the bladder wakes you up, you try to jog, you try to go and do a little Disney marathon and all of a sudden now you're just leaking. It may not be related to the MS. The other issue we know is that we have to remember that some ladies may have genital prolapse. What does that simply mean? The bladder is coming up, coming down, or the rectum. Uterus also. Remember the pelvis is a bowl. I, can't, I have so many things in my hand, but remember the pelvis is a bowl. So three things are in the pelvis. You have the bladder, the vaginal area with the uterus and cervix above, and rectum. And then you have a hammock of muscles that goes from the front to the back. Well, if during the process of childbirth, and I keep stressing childbirth, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I just have to mention that, you know, for women it's a very uh, stressful event. So when you have that process occurring, you can have a damage to the vaginal area. And imagine the vagina as a tube. It has a roof, it has a floor. If the roof gets injured, then the bladder will fall. That's called a cystocele. Basically, the bladder is herniating into the vaginal area. The same is true for the rectum, or you can actually have the uterus falling out, like an inverted sock. So that's what we refer to as genital prolapse. The other issues are related to menopause. We know that there are hormonal issues. When ladies after roughly age 51 start to have a decrease in their estrogen, then the tissue down below may start to have a thinning effect. And because the tissue becomes thinner, then it has less blood supply, and needless to say, the nerves are also affected by this. So sometimes we have to address that situation by giving ladies some form of natural hormonal bioidentical therapy. So I wanted to share with you some of the words that MS patients will share with us. It just confirms to us as providers that continence is a huge issue that we have to take seriously because it is a significant impact. It does have a significant impact on the quality of lives. Uh, for our patients. In terms of what are the symptoms that we should look for, I have listed a few here for you. Um, 
And some patients will say, you know what, I keep going to central care because I keep having recurrent bladder infections. So the first thing I'd like to share with you is that, you know, ask your doctor to refer you to someone who will do what we call a straight cath. What do I mean by that? A straight cath way. We, we don't want you to be going into an urgent care facility and to be just given antibiotics without a thorough analysis being done. What we pride ourselves in doing is trying to get to the root cause of the problem. We're not trying to rush patients in and out like a mill factory. We're trying to do quality work here and treat you the way we would like our loved ones treated. It's very, very simple. If we spend the time with you, then we'll find out what's causing that recurrent bladder infection. We don't want you to be rushed out and just given some antibiotics and say, see you later. That's not the way to treat this situation. It needs to be treated with um, a level of passion and commitment. So it first starts with the patient arriving. If she does have a history of having urinary tract infections, we need to get to the root cause of that. And it begins by us getting a small tube, not a catheter. We use a very, very small, delicate tube that we use to harness sterile conditions, the urine from the bladder. That now removes the factor of potential contamination from the genital area. So we harness the urine from the bladder directly. By doing this, that eliminates the factor of contamination. Now we know what we're dealing with. Is a, is a bug E. coli? Or could it be something really bad like Pseudomonas? Some of these players are really not very nice. And so if you have a Pseudomonas type of bacterial infection, now we're going to take things seriously. There are other bacterial infections that, you know, we certainly don't want to see, like Proteus. These are some of the nasty bacteria that we'll see, and then it raises our eyebrows. Because then now we really have to start to begin to hone in and into what's causing this. Yes, it may be the factor of the multiple sclerosis, and if it is, it can impact the area in multiple ways. One of the ways may be simply, i.e. urinary retention. We see a lot of patients with urinary retention, and it's simply, let me give you this analogy. If the, the bladder is a low pressure zone, when we empty, the bladder should empty at least have less than 100 mils in that bladder. If you're having more than 100 mils, we don't like that. You're going to have urinary stasis. With stasis, then the bacteria get frisky, and they're going to go ahead and multiply and result in a bladder infection. I'm trying to simplify a very complicated concept, but in a nutshell, we want to make sure that that bladder is emptying appropriately. Now, MS will result in the, that floor of muscles. Remember I mentioned that hammock. Sometimes that hammock will not relax. So when the bladder squeezes, that hammock is still tight. So that you still have urine left back in the bladder, and we don't like that. We don't like that for multiple reasons. The other reason why we don't like it is if you have more than 100 mils of urine all the time in your bladder in a chronic situation, guess what's going to happen? Potentially, that pressure can go up to your kidneys. And so we take it very seriously. So we have ultrasound capabilities in our office. We diagnose on a regular basis. Those ladies who unfortunately are not emptying properly, they come in, they've been blown off with multiple antibiotics, and nobody has spent the time to see if Mrs. Jones has enlarged kidneys. Because if you have persistent pressure on your kidneys, obviously you're going to now have an impact on your kidney function. Who wants to be on dialysis? I don't want my family to be on dialysis, and I don't want you. I'm not going to bore you with the neuronal tracts. Suffi sufficient to say, however, I'm going to just reflect and show you. In our office, you'll find that how we as providers approach this thing, we take it one step at a time. The first thing is that we're going to get to the root cause. If you do have symptoms such as urinary urgency frequency, urinary retention, we need to understand what's causing this problem. We therefore may order MRIs of the brain. And in the brain, you can see that the pontine area is the relay station for urinary function. We'll also do MRIs of your lumbar sacral spine in this area here. And that area is another relay station for urinary and uh, rectal function. And so when we get those studies, many times we'll see that there are lesions, lesions in this area. Interestingly, patients will say to you, you know what, doc? I have um, 
persistent back pain, or I have sciatica going down the back of my legs, or my legs are just a little weak now and then. It, it varies. These are some of the factors that clue us in to realize that we need to dig deeper into the condition, and there may be some lesions on the, uh, in the lumbar sacral region or along the spinal column. And so we work in conjunction with your uh, neurologist to make sure that those imaging studies are ordered. So I don't want to be here, um, you know, trying to uh, let you know that everything is horrific. There is so much hope when you have this diagnosis. And I'm here to tell you, let us look on the bright side of things with modern technology. Um, the first thing you have to realize is that you're going to find a good neur um, neurologist who will have an open mind and will work with other specialists to get your quality of life improved. The, it is important to remember that uh, you want to find somebody who is not going to rush you through the door and somebody who understands the diagnosis and will spend the time to work it up accordingly. When I say working it up, we, of course, are going to do a thorough history. And upon entering the office, we will offer you bladder diaries. Simply put, a bladder diary is going to tell us a story. It tells us a story over three to seven days of what's happening with your bladder function or with the fecal function also, with the bowel function. We will ask you to empty the bladder in the, uh, in the commode, in the, up in the bathroom, and then one of the nurses will go and obtain, under sterile conditions, what we call a post-void residual. Here begins the story. You're trying to create a story. The post-void residual, basically, you have emptied, but you should not have a residual greater than 100. You all remember that key number, 100. If it's more than 100, i.e. some patients who we see, it's 300, 800, 500, we don't like that. And you all know, now know why. Then we begin the process of working it up accordingly. We will do the examinations as described above, and we also fo focus on the sexual function because that's a very important factor of life, and we as providers take it seriously to try and enhance your quality of life. In terms of the bladder management, it ranges. It begins with the most conservative to getting fancy with um, implants, etc. We keep things simple. Let's start with fluid management. Let's start with making sure you're, you're drinking 60 floor fluid ounces of fluid per day. You don't need any more than that. Now, you'll say to me, my God, I have to flush out the toxins. Listen, I understand, but physiologically, you need 64 fluid ounces for the day. I'm not going to have you drinking more than that because I need to help you by improving your quality of life. So let's bring it down to eight fluid ounces per day, of eight glasses per day, of, uh, of fluid. I'm going to say to you, avoid the caffeine. I, I know that the, the, the teas and the iced teas are very good, but you know, it will, it, caffeine is a known irritant of your bladder. So those ladies who have urinary urgency frequency, it can be an irritant and a problem. Pelvic floor exercises. You will talk about Kegels exercises. Well, it's easy for me up here to say to you, oh, go and do Kegels and blow you off and tell you to go to the door. And so there, we actually have in our office natural forms of therapy. Uh, we have special machines that do the exercises for you. And it's equivalent to doing a thousand Kegels exercises, but you are in the comfort of the office and it actually works. Um, I'm going to move fast because my friend Stuart is giving me a, a time here. But moving faster, we try to educate you in terms of training your bladder. The bladder can be trained. You are in charge. The brain is not, is in charge, not the bladder. And we will go over things and methods in the office in terms of doing timed voids. Um, the ISC, intermittent self-catheterization. Self we'll talk about that briefly. Um, and we'll talk about some medications. I'm moving along a little faster. Please feel free afterwards to see myself and my, prov my provider, uh, Minade Ladaquente. She's in the back. We are here for you, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. But in the interest of time and to respect my colleague to follow, I'll move along a little faster. We have certain medications that we use to assist 
with urinary urgency frequency. They're called anticholinergics. They may give you a dry mouth. So we're obviously not going to rush and give you those medications, especially since I want to make sure I'm giving you medications that go hand in hand and collaborate with your primary diagnoses. Um, typically, however, we can give you medications like Vesicare or Mybetric that have no negative cross-reactions with your MS medications. Here I mentioned the intermittent self-caths. I mentioned to you that and we teach our patients how to do that. Now, not all patients are obviously candidates for this because you have to have some amount of dexterity. Um, we, of course, there are dis disadvantages to it, including the fact of you know, having to find a public facility to do this. Um, here are some of the aids that are available to help patients with this diagnosis. Um, and of course, let's quickly talk about Botox. Botox is actually something that we do in our office and we do it with the patients comfortable. The patients come in, we numb the bladder with a lidocaine-based solution, we come out of the room, let you relax, then we come back in 20 minutes later and we literally do the Botox with you awake, your loved one beside you, and the Botox lasts six to nine months roughly and has a significant improvement in your quality of life by decreasing those episodes of urgency, frequency, and incontinence. Now, sacral nerve stimulation, this is a, the analogy is basically a pacemaker. In our, in our bodies, you can have a pacemaker for your heart, one for the stomach. Guess what? You can have one for your bladder and rectum also. And this is what I'm talking about. In my algorithm, to be quite frank with you, we as providers offer this not upfront because we try to treat you the way we would like to be treated. Simply put, this would be our last resort for all patients who have gone through the gamut of medications and other forms of conservative therapy. If that's not working, then this will be offered. Over 70% success rate. It is an amazing technology. Basically, it improves the communication between the brain, bladder, brain, and um, anus. It's basically is short circuiting the area we're in the spinal column and its central nervous system that's affected. Consider it a form of neuromodulation that's bypassing the area that's affected. We can discuss it in further detail. Um, one of my colleagues previously mentioned the cannabis issue. It has been proven in our literature to significantly help with bladder function and, um, uh, and so it's on a significant research. I'll be quickly mentioning the bowel aspect of things. A lot of patients have constipation and fecal incontinence. And one of the things with MS is that it does affect your ability to sense the presence of the stool in the uh, rectum. Remember, the, the, the nerve endings in the, in the rectum are extremely intelligent. It has to tell you, is there a solid there, liquid, or gas? And what happens with MS is that over time, that sensitivity, that, that ability to perceive which one is it, what, which one is present, the sampling reflex gets diminished. The other aspect of MS is that it will slow down our colon motility time, and so ladies will end up with constipation. Um, we want to talk about the impact in terms of the abdominal muscles, slow transit time, what we try to do is keep things simple. We try to increase your bulk and fluid intake. And um, also, we have options such as enemas as well as suppositories. The, we have to, have to, have to remember that there are certain medications that do impact bowel function. And um, we go through these in detail with our patients before we go to prescribe any form of therapeutic intervention. Simple things like iron supplements, antidepressants, i.e. tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline, ever, you know, these nortriptyline, these agents are known to be constipating. So keep things simple. Let's give you, improve your diet, increase your fluid intake, and um, we try to give you osmotic laxatives to um, minimize using stimulants of the bowel. If patients are affected with fecal incontinence, you can even use um, anal plugs as well as, because I personally, um, I'm not a proponent of using diapers. I wouldn't want my loved one in diapers, so I'm going to, I'm going to do everything within my power to get you out of adult diapers. 
Anal irrigation is an option for those who are afflicted with the constipation. It's an easier uh, form of therapy. It's very, it promotes all my patients being independent and not having to do uh, fecal uh, disimpactions. Um, so where possible, we really are advocates of conservative therapy. As we take the journey together, we get to the root cause of the problem. Whether you may have urinary dysfunction, such as urinary urgency frequency, nocturia, or bowel issues, such as constipation or fecal incontinence, we are here to join you on the journey, working with your neurologist to help you with this entity, and we are determined to get to the root cause of the problem and not rush to any fancy implants and all of this sort of thing. Our contact information is listed here. I wanted to identify specifically in the audience our other provider, Mineli Laraquente. Mineli, please stand. She's such a lovely person. I have to highlight her. She's a very modest lady. She used to work with a neurology-based practice in town, a practice I have a lot of respect for. And she and I knew each other for over 10 years in the GYN field. And she has now joined our practice. So we are very comfortable with working with patients with this entity. We also haven't forgotten our male friends. Those of you who have as men with the diagnosis of MS, we'll be happy to share with you those colleagues, i.e. those urologists in town, who are comfortable and are happy to take care of this entity. And as we join the journey, let's think about today. T tomorrow is not promised. So let's enjoy today and give thanks for what we have and think positively. And I thank Stuart for this amazing program. Have a lovely morning. Thank you. Let's give it that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our next person is Justin Konitzer. Justin has spoken for us a few times in the past in this area. In fact, last year when we did the symposium, he was here to speak as well. And uh, today, Instead of him talking about cognitive issues or impact of MS on the family, which he's done for us a few times in the past, he's here now just to speak with you about the neuropsychological testing that some of us have gone through, remembering like when they give you a series of words to remember or numbers or whatever. I don't know. He's going to talk to you about it. I don't remember that stuff. How many out there have actually had some neuropsychological testing done already? Raise your hand. Okay, this is excellent. Less than half the group. So for you guys, some of this will be refresher, maybe pick up some new information. And for the rest of the group, you'll learn something new, let's hope. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on the generic overview of MS because you've gotten abundance of it already and most of you are experts. Okay, I'll throw up some slides just to get you in the mood. And because I'm going to talk about the way that the disease process itself plays out in a neuropsychological assessment context. So we need to remind ourselves of certain aspects of the disease that are basic. Okay. Um, like, for example, back to the neuron. Tricia and uh, my other colleagues back there spoke about brain cells um, in abundance. But let's look at it real quick just to get another visual. This is one brain cell, and one brain cell is called a neuron. This is what neurologists primarily deal with at the basic level. And what I want you to just pay attention to here in this picture is that the cell itself, I'm using the pointer over on the screen to your right, is right here. This is called the cell body, this pink piece. And then the axon is the cord that runs along the length of the neuron. That's the axon. And the myelin sheath, the thing we all know about, this fatty substance is the white bubbles, pill-like encapsulations that surround the axon. You probably already know this, but if you don't, the myelin sheath give the electrical impulses that run down a nerve cell, they conduct that. So they make that process go faster. Okay, and that's important. When you have, well, let me ask you. That's the nerve cell. What is this? It's the brain. And what actually are you looking at? What substance are you looking at when you look at the brain? The, the, I hear white matter, gray matter. I hear all, well, basically, these are billions and billions of neurons or nerve cells. Individual cells packed densely together make brain tissue. 
So when you see a brain or think about a brain, think that slide I just showed you, the cell, it's billions and billions of those cells compacted together that make up the brain. What you're actually looking at primarily is gray matter or the cell bodies that I showed you on the previous slide. The white matter, for the most part, runs from the outside of the brain that we're looking at here down inward toward the middle of the brain. That's the white matter, those long axons that have the myelin sheath around them, primarily, not completely, but primarily. A long, long time ago, uh, a guy by the name of Gall, Francis Gall, championed this idea. You guys have probably seen these in, in popular media and other places, and you can't see it too well from your seat, but I want to explain to you that this is the idea of a skull, and around the skull are different uh, functions, of human functions. And so again, you can't read it probably, but right here, that, that word says wit. And the short story here is that a long time ago, there were certain practitioners called phrenologists that thought that the way that your skull undulated, the, the form that it took, the different bubbles that it had, and the different uh, topography of your skull could predict certain aspects of your personality and behavior, such that for everyone, wit was located this area in your skull, and if you had a little bump, maybe you were funnier or less funny, okay? And coming down the front, you carried a tune right here on your skull, and if you, the way that that particular skull was shaped would de would predict how well or, or not you could carry a tune. And so all of your functions, thinking, memory, everything had a specific location on the skull. Were those scientists way back uh, when, were they correct? 17th century. No. You know, I'm a, I'm a bald guy, so you can't read my personality by looking at the undul undulations of my skull. It's not true. But they were on to something, and what we've come to learn and uh, Connie showed it earlier, is that certain locations in your brain absolutely do correspond to certain functions in your behavior, both your mood and your behavior. So that if I went deep within the brain and stimulated a certain area called the hippocampus, I could mess with your ability to form new memories, pretty, pretty specifically. Not all brain areas specifically localized to behavioral functions. Long, complicated way of saying, I could poke and prod around, and I can't exactly all the time predict what behavioral function I'm going to be poking and prodding around with. But in large part, I can get it pretty close. If I wanted to stop you from speaking or cause problems with your language, I could go into the left side of your temporal lobe and play around a little bit and probably change your language. It's pretty neat in a way. And it's going to be real helpful in MS and other disorders as we talk about this here in neuropsychological assessment. Just another quick picture of what I'm talking about. You needn't really study this. There's no test. You don't have to know what slice of the brain we're looking at. But this is just a uh, map to show you that certain physical parts of your body, like your hand, your face, and your legs, and your feet, correspond to certain areas of your brain. Again, such that if I were to go in and poke this area deep within this recess of your brain, in a certain part of your brain, you would feel a sensation in your foot. Right? Likewise, if I were to go in here and poke this, you'd feel something in your nose and hand, etc. So what is neuropsychology, this long, complicated word, for those of you who don't know? It's a combination, in some sense, of neurology and psychology. That's the word. Uh, neuropsychologist is a psychologist that specializes in the assessment of brain injury and disease, the assessment and treatment of brain injury and disease. And we are primarily interested in brain behavior relationships. How do we get at trying to understand brain behavior relationships? That is what we've been talking about, the relationship between local parts of your brain and how you behave. Well, how we do it is we administer tests. And how you perform on particular tests give us an understanding of what might possibly be going on in your brain. We infer from your performance what might be going on in your brain. Pretty cool, huh? Now, some, I'll, get, I'll get ahead of myself and answer a question. You might say, well, doc, we've got MRIs that can tell us what's going on in our brain. Why do we need you? I think my colleagues will agree, the science of imaging 
is not exact. And I think I heard Connie say it earlier, we don't know that a particular lesion is necessarily going to cause a particular symptom or behavioral manifestation. We don't know that. It's not an exact science. So we need these tests to really hone what skills you're good at and what skills you're a little bit weaker in. So why, why do we do this testing? For those of you who raised your hand, you might have remembered that the process can be lengthy, right? Tiring. Um, and we got to have a good reason to do the test. Above and beyond all the other imaging that you get, there's got to be a good reason. So someone tell me, I know you're eating, but you can whisper out in between bites, what's one good reason we might do neuropsychological testing to get a better idea of the relationship between what's going on in your brain and your behavior? Whether you could still work is a great answer, right? We want to know what about your functioning is limited or not limited. So here are the four main reasons, and there's many other reasons, but let's take a quick look at these. Identify cognitive weaknesses, and I'm an optimist um, into that, the, the health and wellness model of medicine, so I should put slash cognitive strengths, because someone with MS or any condition also has cognitive strengths. We also want to uh, use testing to detect changes in cognitive profiles over time. If I do a test, a neuropsychological test, and say, you have this strong functioning, your memory's good, your attention's good, right? But you relapse, you know, two years down the line, you might be weak in certain areas. So we want to do repeated or what we call serial testing over time, if need be, to look at how your profile changes. Uh, assist in treatment planning or rehabilitation, that's an important purpose. And then lastly on here, you're going to hear after me uh, an attorney speak on disability law and how it relates to MS. And so we want to be able to document disability. Document and facilitate disability determinations. What is testing? Well, in the limited time that I have to speak, I cannot go through all of what testing is, so I'm going to go through a couple of basic examples to give you the picture. Testing is paper and pencil, non-invasive. It's interactive. Uh, here is a generic picture of a neuropsychologist working with a patient, and if you can't see that too clearly, it looks like there are some puzzles. There are some cue cards with puzzles and then some puzzle pieces. It's like being a kid again. Um, and basically what's going on here is they're assessing one's ability to create this puzzle, and probably they're, doing, they're, they're trying to see how fast they can do it and get it right. And so it involves a lot of your cognitive functions you might not even be aware of. It obviously invol involves vision, your visual cortex, and your vision, your eyes. It involves spatial relationships. As you bring the pieces together, you've got to know where they fit. And it involves processing speed because, as I said, there's likely a time component to this task. So we want to see how quickly you can arrive at the correct puzzle. Okay? We also do a lot of paper and pencil tests, like I said. Um, memory is an area that's assessed. I might read you a short story and, after 10 minutes, ask you to tell me back as much of that story as you can remember and uh, the like. Now, for a skeptic in the room, and I was a skeptic when I first approached the field of neuropsych testing uh, 20 years ago, um, it sounds a little hokey-dokey, right? Oh, tell me a story, I'll tell it back to you, and I'll just give you uh, a grade. You passed, you did good, you told me most of the story. Not really. We go through some pretty intense procedures to arrive at numbers from which we can compare your profile, how you performed. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. The cognitive domains typically tested in a standard neuropsychological assessment are all these. Not all the time. There are briefer assessments, um, but for the large majority of batteries that are administered, we do test IQ, or at least get an estimate of your intelligence, your IQ. Processing speed seems obvious. Memory, executive functioning, or these are higher level decision making skills. Executive functions are your ability to organize your own behavior and execute. Motor skills, visual spatial skills, language, and problem solving. Ah, and we can't forget down here on the right about personality and psychological functioning, right? Neuropsychology, the blending of neurology and psychology. As, um, as, as Tricia said, I think, earlier, uh, there is a, a cycle. And your personality disposition and your mood state 
intimately affect your ability to perform on cognitive tests. And likewise, your cognitive wherewithal absolutely affects your mood. So they're interrelated, and we need to also assess your psychological functioning and mood in order to get a sense of the bigger picture for what's going on with you. How do I prepare? What are the nuts and bolts of a neuropsych evaluation? Well, the process is typically over multiple visits to a neuropsychologist, okay? For those of you who have had the testing before and raised your hand, how many of you had more than one visit? Okay, most people, for sure. Um, you usually go for about an hour interview, and that's where we learn of your MS, uh, in your case, and how you're functioning and, and what your life is like and where you feel you struggle. And the, the follow-up visits are usually where the testing happens, and there could be one, two, or sometimes even three, depending on your, your level of functioning. We know that fatigue is an issue. Do we want to sit you down for five hours straight and test you, one test after another? What do you think is going to happen to the results at the fifth hour? You're going to be tired. I'm going to be tired, and I don't have, especially have, fatigue issues. So we want to break the testing out. So I recommend here bring a snack. You can see my recommendations. Testing can take anywhere from three to eight hours, again, broken out over multiple sessions. Um, you should be an advocate for yourself if you're going through a neuropsych testing process. Tell the examiner or the neuropsychologist, hey, I need a break, I'm tired. I can't emphasize enough, in order to get accurate, fine-tuned results about your overall cognitive profile and how you're doing, we need your 100% effort, your maximal effort. And if factors like fatigue or mood begin to interfere with you producing your best effort, guess what? The data we get is going to be biased. We're going to be assessing your mood and your fatigability and not really your memory. Anybody who's tired isn't going to be functioning on all cylinders, right? So you've got to be an advocate for yourself and say, hey, I need a break. I need 10 minutes to gather myself. Or, hey, doc, I'm done for the day, really. This is my limit. Okay? And, and neuropsychologists who do this day in and day out have a really good sensitivity to different conditions and what's required. So trust that we know how to set up these sessions to optimize your effort and how to be accommodating to you. How do we know where a person stands after a test? This is what I alluded to earlier. Am I just going to say, okay, Stuart, you told me a little bit of that story. I say your memory's about a C. Good job. Work harder at getting to be a B. No. That's not what we do. Quick memory test. Take a look at this list. I'll read them to you. Try to remember these. Banana, shoe, watch, table, dime, pickle, hat. Good job. And keep eating. You know, you're remembering that list. You're remembering. You're remembering. I've got 13, Stuart. Uh-oh. Should I go with you? Okay. How many of the items can you remember? Now, you're all eating, so don't write them down. Just tell them to yourself. Okay, tell them to yourself. All right. So there were seven items. How'd you do? I hear a lot of grumbling. Okay. So let me get into the point. What's the point of doing that? Well, it's to tell you that how we determine how you do on certain tests is we give these tests to thousands and thousands of people who don't have disease. Sometimes we do with disease, but thousands and thousands of people who don't have disease, and we measure their performance, and it takes many years to do this. We develop what we call norms or normal performance levels. Okay, if I were to tell you the average or normative performance on that memory task is five out of seven items is what the average person does after measuring 3,000 average people in the country, then that's our average number. And what we do when we get your particular test item is we compare you to 3,000 other normal people that constructed the test. And we look on this, what's called a bell-shaped curve, and see where you fall. 50% of people on most neuropsychological tests or behavioral tests perform in the average range. If you can't read that, that's the big bump. That's the majority of people. And then as you move out, or to the left end, we'll say less than seven items. And to going to the right, we'll say all the way up to full seven items on that task. We fall. If you get one or two items, you might lie down in the low range or deficient range because on average, many, many more people got two or above. 
you got two or below, so that's where you fall. So the short story here is not to learn the bell curve, obviously, but to understand that these tests are norm-driven, and they're very specific, statistically-driven tests that we find are very valuable. Um, your performance is being compared to thousands of other people who perform normally. Just a, a, another image here to show you that bell curve is made up of people's performance, right? So you've got individual people in there if you can't see them. And if you fall in the range where there's only three people or one person, then you're not in the normative average range, okay? So when that neuropsychologist sits you down and gives you feedback and says, you performed very weak on that task, they're deriving their conclusions on real numbers. So what does neuropsychological testing tell us about MS? Uh, a couple things. The clinical presentation in MS is highly variable, obviously. We've talked about that. Everybody has different symptoms at different times. So guess what? The neuropsychological data in MS is also highly variable. In other words, there is not a multiple sclerosis profile that everybody who has it has poor memory, good attention, you know, poor visual skills. No, believe it or not, there's no profile. Are there commonalities? Sure. We tend to find that information processing speed, attention, and memory, those three, are primarily affected if and when someone is going to have cognitive problems. Remember, only about 50% of folks with MS ever develop measurable cognitive issues. So many of you may not have these issues at all. But those who are going to have these issues are likely to have the first three. And then we also find um, visual spatial abilities and executive functioning can be impaired. When I talk about visual spatial, I'm not talking about vision. I know that one of the uh, secondary to optic neuritis, one of the early signs for some folks is vision loss and visual issues. That has to do with your optic nerve in your eye, not the part of your brain that deals with visual and spatial processing. That's what I'm talking about there. Okay, um, I, I want to kind of move toward the end of my talk here by talking about one basic concept, and this is a, a, a nice one for you. One study showed accuracy of processing is not compromised unless high working memory demands are involved. Problems in neurocognitive functioning in MS are mainly modulated by speed, and in particular when attention demanding controlled information processing is required. Right? That makes sense. Say what? Right? Okay. So that's the, that's the lingo, but what does that mean to you? A real short story. It means there are newer theories and data to support the idea that the primary deficit in MS, consistent with that review we did of the myelin sheath, is with information processing speed. The speed with which you take in information, process it, and respond to the world. So that function, information processing speed, lies at the core of many of your other cognitive functions. For example, people with memory issues. What if I were to give you this math problem and say, solve that problem? And then done. <laughs> Can you solve it? Because I gave it to you too quickly. So by giving you the problem too quickly, I've, sl I've artificially slowed your information processing speed. I didn't give you enough time to work through the problem. Whereas if I put it up like this and say, go ahead and solve that problem, and I'm going to let your information processing speed be as slow or fast as you want it to be, you have all day, how many of you can get the answer? A lot more people, right? It's not an incredibly complicated problem. So the take-home point here is that if we allow you to process information a little bit slower, if in fact you have some information processing speed deficits, you will get the answer. So your cognitive functioning is not necessarily, or your memory is not necessarily impaired. It's just that your speed of processing information is reduced, and that complicates many, if not all, of your other cognitive functions. It's a cool thing because guess what? Most people with MS have IQs or intelligences that are okay at baseline or fine but still have some memory and other cognitive weaknesses because of the processing speed issue. Uh, one last note here. Um, there's newer research, and we're getting into the subtypes of MS, and you know we had four, and now six and eight. There's variants of MS and patterns over time. Uh, one of these later studies is starting to get into analyzing neurocognitive patterns of performance on neuropsych testing depending on your subtype of MS. 
And in one study, uh, uh, a pretty big study, um, concluded that those with the progressive subtype show more executive deficits. Those are those higher level thinking skills, decision making. And those with relapsing remitting are more likely to present with memory related issues. And what we think that has to do with is lesion load at this point. Okay, because the more progressive you are, the, high, the more impact your overall brain's going to have, and that's going to affect your executive skills. Whereas when you relapse and you remit, you still have the information processing speed issue, perhaps, resulting in some memory issues. Not enough time to take in the information. Doc, how can you expect me to remember it or show you that I remember it if I didn't have enough time? Okay, it's not really my memory. It's my speed of processing. Uh, I guess there is one last thing here. We can't forget about the psychology and neuropsychology. I mentioned this already. But it's our job not only to assess all of those thinking skills through tests, but also to assess your mood. And here are two main ways mood can impact not only your performance on the test, but your performance in the world, your functioning in the world. Chronic low mood affects the quality of information because most people who are depressed start to turn inward with their thoughts and focus on their mood all the time and how, you know, kind of down they feel. And that interferes with someone's telling them, hey, you know, my name's uh, John Johnson. Nice to meet you. My name's Sally Johnson. Nice to meet you. And you're just kind of going around meeting people but not really paying attention because your mood is so low. So how the heck could you remember their names later? Right? So mood plays a role that way. And mood also, we're starting to, know, to learn, plays a role on your physio physiology. So depression, we're just getting into this research now. Chronic depression can have an impact directly on your nerve cells and uh, lower your certain levels of chemicals in your brain that's going to affect, thereby affect your cognitive performance. Uh, I, I gave you a couple resources. I can give you those later, um, running just about out of time. Uh, these I found, I don't endorse these, I'm not working for University of North Carolina or anything, but online doing a quick search, I found these are really good examples of the neuropsychological testing, what it is and the process of it. So if anything I said didn't make sense or you wanted to follow up, you could look at these two resources on neuropsychology in general. And then references. I guess we're going to do a um, combined question and answer now with Dr. Walker and myself, and I'll let Stuart come up and introduce that section. We're going to go around the room. This time it'll be Maida. She's going to be on that side of the room where it's dark. And I'm going to be on this side of the room where it's dark. Okay? And does anybody have any questions for the urologist or the psychologist? Start showing your hands so I know where we're going. If I go through your testing, what would be the benefit for me? What could you do for me once you have all of the information? I came from a uh, field of neuropsychology that focused on um, treatment and patient-centered care. So in my model, the way I practice is follow-up care, treatment. Okay, but I will tell you, unfortunately, probably 60 to 70 percent of other neuropsychologists are just focused on the assessment piece alone. So you would go through that process, get your data, and then have to go elsewhere, maybe to something like Trisha's group to get follow-up treatment. Um, what could we do for you, though? What could I do? Well, we look at your profile, see where your weaknesses are. If you need any kind of cognitive remediation skill training, we could either engage you in that right there or refer you out to OT or someone that can do it. Um, and also the counseling end, because we're trained in, in the brain behavior relationships, we know how mood impacts your ability to function, so we can address that there. Uh, a good, a well-trained neuropsychologist who understands the bigger picture will want to take consideration of how you're coping with your symptoms and your illness, uh, and help you build your coping skills to improve functioning. Because I think this, we can't emphasize this enough, Trisha and her group, um, and even Dr. Walker emphasized, we are a whole being, right? And our mood state affects the level of our abilities in these other states. We can't say if we have a positive mood, we're not going to have incontinence, perhaps. But we can say dealing with that and functioning and coping better with that can be enhanced by a good counseling and mood improvement. I hope that helps. Okay. My question is for Dr. Walker. Hello? Dr. Walker. <laughs> I'm right here. 
Um, this is the first time I ever heard of a lumbar MRI in use with MRI. I always thought it was cervical and thoracic. And you said that a lumbar or sacral region MRI would be helpful in finding out something about this part, these problems? That's the right. first I'd ever heard of that. So it's, it's amazing. The MRI can be used in many areas of the body, one being the lumbar sacral area. We call it the LS. We always like to shorten things. So MRI of your LS spine, meaning what we're looking for any lesions in this area. I'll always coordinate the imaging with the neurology group who you'll, you know, will be the primary and make sure that they have not imaged other areas before I go and order additional MRI films. So if you're going to get an MRI and you're going to see, say, a, a urogynecologist, it's important that, you know, we coordinate with them to make sure we're not giving you, you know, repeating the same test. But to answer your question, yes, the lumbar sacral spine is the area that we are honing in on to see if there is any impact on your urinary function. My question is for the psychologist, please. I underwent some testing where they actually stimulated me electrically in certain areas to see a reaction in others, and then they made me stare at screens with all these things connected to me to see different wavelengths and whatnot. Now, this is what I thought was the neural testing. What was this? Sure. In? sure. Um, there is a lot of confusion around that. That's why I emphasize it. neuropsych is non-invasive. Um, the grander field of neuropsychology research, uh, et cetera, can involve certain things like evoke potentials and looking at if we stimulate certain areas of your brain, how do you function cognitively. But in terms of, certainly in terms of disability assessments and evaluations and non-disability, but we're just wanting to look and see how you function, neuropsychology does not uh, involve invasive research-based protocols. Um, sometimes you'll do that kind of testing too before you go in for brain surgery, which is not the case for, for you, but just to let the other folks know, that's in, an invasive procedure and we're really looking to make sure that we don't go into certain areas of the brain that are going to be uh, significantly impactful negatively for you. And so it sounds like you were going through um, some type of protocol, or a, a research-based protocol probably, to look at when we evoke certain areas of your brain what kind of cognitive response do you have? That's very different than assessing your brain from the outside to see where your cognitive skills lie, if you know what I mean. Because we can go into anybody's brain and poke around and see if their vision changes or their language changes, regardless of whether they have MS or not. Um, one thing related to that, I will say, always be an advocate for yourself. Please ask questions about the procedures you're going in for and get clarity if you feel like you need clarity. Okay. Question here. This question is for Dr. Uh, Walker. I live in North Tampa. It's not really um, feasible for me to drive to see you. Do you recommend a Euro gynecologist in the Tampa area? So in the Tampa area, um, there is Dr. George Lenz, L-E-N-S-E. His uh, Christian name is J-O-R. GE, he's in the Clearwater area. Um, there is also Dr. Mona McCullough. Mona, M O N A McCullough, M C C O L L O U G H. Both of those physicians are very good. All right. Uh, Dr. Walker, um, I recently had a, a friend, she has MS, and she had like 35, 40 injections of Botox in the bladder. And I was wondering for a male, how different is the injections and the success ratio? And I mean, is it realistic or safe to be getting Botox every six to nine months in the bladder? Excellent question. So to answer your question, is, it, is there any difference between male versus female? No, no difference. When I'm giving you Botox in the blood, I'm going to be very upfront with you. I'm going to say to you, it's going to improve your quality of life within seven to 10 days, and it will last six to nine months. What I'm going to say to you is this. Make sure you choose a practice where they're not going to put you to sleep to do this. 
If the practitioner can be comfortable and has a practice where they have a procedure room where this procedure can be done in a very antiseptic environment safely and within 10 minutes you're in and out, then I would be an advocate of repeating the Botox every nine months because it's safe. If you have a practitioner who they have to go through the process of putting you to sleep for this, in my opinion, I wouldn't want that for my family member. So then I am going to say, okay, what's my, next, what's my next option? The other option could be, and even before we get to the Botox, there's something called urgent PC. It's another form of, it's a form of acupuncture to be very frank with you. Urgent PC, U-R-G-E-N-T-P-C. So basically imagine this is a nerve here. Your, the posterior tibial nerve is accessed. And using an acupuncture needle, that nerve goes to the back that I keep talking about and resets the sacral micturation center, the area in your back that controls your nerve function. So before we even rush to the Botox, I, in our practice, we prefer to offer that as a less invasive option. That, together with pelvic floor, we have an entire department within the same office that just focuses on that all the time. So the patients feel more comfortable. For you, as a gentleman, there are colleagues of mine who will be happy to share with you who are comfortable with doing this. But I would say to you, let's go more conservative first. The urgent PC, I think you'll be very impressed with. You're coming on a weekly basis. You come, you put the leg up, access the nerve, you read a newspaper, read your iPad, and 30 minutes later, you go home, you go back to office or to your, to your job. Um, there is no shock, there is no discomfort, truthfully. And within four to six sessions, you notice a significant improvement in your quality of life. And when I say significant, I'm talk, talking about a seven, 65 to 70% improvement. So I hope I answered your question. So in the mail, what um, we would have to do for the mail, of course, we would have to use more of a flexible scope and go in with a flexible, I'm sorry, a flexible sister scope. So we go in and use a, a flexible needle, Botox needle, and it goes in through the penile urethra directly into the bladder, and then we give you the injections that way. For the ladies, we don't need to do that because the urethra is so much shorter, it's much more uh, accessible. Okay, next question is back here. The first thing I wanted to say is thank you for, on, this is for Dr. Walker. Not, I feel like, number one, on the, dig, the dignity topic of the bladder and the diapers, thank you. Because how bad does it have to get before, and you've done everything right. You've done everything on the caffeine and you've stopped things, but how bad does it have to get before the Botox, before that. And thank you again for the anesthesia. It's like putting you out in the natural and all that stuff, but the bladder is something that if I could fire it and get rid of it, and I don't want it. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. I think I asked a question. Did she ask a question? How bad does it have to get before she has to start Botox? Oh. Or something else. In my opinion, I don't want my wife having that issue, so why should I have you? So then, in my opinion, if you come to see us as providers, we're not going to be here dithering. We are, you come to see us. When you come to see us, we are going to get to the, a solution. Within one to two visits, we are going to move quickly to get you the dignity you deserve. So I'm saying, you know, once we get the root cause assessed, within two or three visits, we are giving you the appropriate form of therapy. That may be, of course, a Botox. So you have my word on that. We're not going to be having you doing diaries and yes. in, a, in a vicious loop. No. You're here for a reason, and the reason is an issue with urinary uh, incontinence or whatever that may be. We're going to definitively address it and treat you the way we would like to be treated. Dr. Walker, I have a question for you. Um, I have been given the bladder stimulator. I've also gone through Botox. Um, I have a, sp a spastic bladder. I'm on oxybutyn. 
Um, prior to that, I had several uh, UTIs. I can remember them my whole life. Um, then my bladder stopped functioning properly, and now I have a suprapubic catheter. Um, I want, and now with the suprapubic catheter, I also have UT, uh, UTIs like crazy, and pill form no longer works for me antibiotic-wise, so I have to have IV antibiotics. Um, I wanted to ask you if there's anything in my case that would help kind of prevent that, because not only am I having that issue now, now I'm to the part where my bowels, I can't control that anymore. So I feel like it's progressing from front to back. So I would definitely say to you, we'd have to sit down together and review the entire history and do a thorough exam. Okay. Meeting you, of course, for the first time today, it's difficult for me to really give you a, a diagnostic intervention, but we'll be happy to work with your primary neurologist, and if that group you know, has no problem with us co-managing, we'll be honored to do that. Okay. Um, but there are therapeutic options, but as I said, I would never want to spew out uh, information to you that's wrong. Okay. I'd have to sit down and we would, the providers, we would sit down and dissect everything what has been done in the past, where are you now, and work in conjunction with your neurologist to make sure we're managing you appropriately. Do you have a card? Yes, and our provider, Mineli Lara Quente, she's standing. Um, we're in the back. We're happy to talk with you okay. afterwards. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Dr. Kernitzer, I have a question regarding some of the uh, slides that you put up. C could you give a, a specific example or s examples of what executive function disorders would be in cognitive dysfunction? Sure, uh, and I did kind of breeze through that one because it, it gets quite complex. Um, the question is about executive functioning, specific example of executive functioning. What I like to give uh, as a metaphor for your executive skills, um, is this. When you drive a car, you need your physical ability to be intact, right? You need your foot to be able to hit the gas and the brake. You need some processing speed to go from your brain to your foot to control that at certain speeds. It can be intact, but if you don't do it quick enough, there can be issues. You need your attention skills to be intact because you need to be scanning your environment, looking in your mirrors, paying attention, right? You need your visual spatial abilities to be intact because you need to know stopping distance, turning distance, distance from the curb, and that involves spatial ability and perception ability. Uh, and you need your just overall judgment on when to go, um, when to stop, you know, how fast to put your foot down, take some judgment in, in learning how to operate a car. So your executive skills are the kinds of skills that integrate all of the functions I just mentioned and allow them to run smoothly together. And the term executive is appropriate here because it's kind of like the executive of a company or a country getting all of his or her sub-vice presidents and executives together to manage their particular areas smoothly so that the whole system works. Okay? So quickly here, specific behavioral examples of executive dysfunction. Um, we usually talk about executive skills being located in your frontal lobes or paths to your frontal lobes. When people have executive dysfunction, they often become socially disinhibited, okay, because they don't have the kind of feedback or break mechanism, okay? You know, we all have sort of thoughts that come up from time to time, and then we just kind of like push them down or go away from them because we know it's inappropriate. It, like a what? Sure, sure, same thing, exactly, Phineas Gage, yeah. So, um, you know, so if you have those, those areas damaged, what you often see is people's personality change. They might um, be a little bit more impulsive socially. You go out to dinner with them and what an appropriate thing to say to the waiter or waitress is, they may go a little bit far, or be a little more tangential or be sexually inappropriate, for example. They can't put the brakes on. Um, they may not be able to integrate all their functions in the driving example I gave you, and they may be really good at speeding the car straight, but the minute you got to brake at a light or make a decision on stopping speed, do I go through the yellow light or not, they might not be able to pull it all together to do that soundly. So, um, so overall, executive involves your planning, decision-making, 
integration of functions, and ultimate execution of a behavior in the world. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, having a paper monster in your life is an example of not knowing where to file Multitasking, sure. That's all. When it's functioning well, you can do all those things. And the reason it gets a little confusing um, is because we all sort of do executive functions automatically. It's not something you really have to learn. It's, it's learned over time automatically. So the only way to really understand it is to talk about dysfunction of it. When it's not working, here's what happens. Okay, by default, you have it. When it doesn't work, it begins to have these behavioral symptoms. Next question over there. Thank you both, Dr. Walker and Dr. Konitzer. My question is for Dr. Konitzer. Are the testing, are testings that you do covered by Medicare and supplements? Um, first of all, this is always a struggle with, with these kind of presentations. Um, because I, I got to tell you, I don't do um, test. I don't have a private practice. I work for the federal government, so I do neuropsychology within... Uh, that arena. And so me personally, um, I don't have that ability. Do other folks in the community, neuropsychologists? Yes, some do. Some work with those, those insurances. Some are private pay only. Um, but I know in Orlando, I know someone asked Dr. Walker for recommendations. I don't want to give you a particular individuals. Um, I don't want to be biased, but I can tell you this. In this general area, in all of Florida really, I'm connected into the network of neuropsychologists. There's plenty of them out there with a range of services and a range of insurances accepted. So um, going through your primary insurance to find one shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, we're over here now. This is for Dr. Knitzer. I was wondering if you could talk about the stimulating antidepressants that could be used as well as if you can talk about the presence of ADHD that can be masked within the presence of MS as well and how, the, how that affects the cognitive functioning. Okay. Um, antidepressants are tricky. Some are a little bit more stimulating. Um, others um, kind of calm you down. Depression and anxiety, we're learning, are very correlated. So sometimes people will be depressed and anxious and they'll need to be calmed a little bit. Other times people will be depressed and lethargic and we need to be activated a little bit to get back into life. That's a particular question that you really probably should follow up with your primary provider because antidepressants in general are very banal, minimal side effects usually, but the question came up about cancer treatment alongside of treatments for MS. In some situations, certain antidepressants you might not want to use. Um, so I, I'll leave that particular question to you and your provider. But to say generally, yes, there are, uh, there are stimulating types of antidepressants that work with certain neurotransmitters, and there are um, kind of calming antidepressants that don't. The second part of your question, ADHD overlay, let's face it, any condition that you might have, um, bipolar disorder, ADHD, depression that precedes your MS and is for all our knowledge unrelated, okay? Um, we're humans, so we can have comorbid disorders. So like anything else, we wanna make sure that treatment for one situation doesn't negatively impact your other, and it's always a cost-benefit analysis. ADHD is primarily in, in children treated with stimulants. Um, there is no such thing as adult ADHD, and you can throw tomatoes at me. What people who say they have adult ADHD is, is people who had childhood ADHD and maybe didn't get it recognized and it continued on into their adulthood and now it's only coming out and they're recognizing it. So for adults, because we know MS doesn't really impact folks under 15 all that often, for most adults who have ADHD and recognize it, stimulants tend to not be used as much in adults than in as kids uh, because as the symptoms migrate from childhood to adulthood, they tend the hyperactivity component tends to calm and the symptoms are different, just distractibility, problems multitasking. So I'm meandering toward the idea that stimulants may not be the greatest thing for adult manifestations of ADHD in general, um, and so you might not have to worry about that complication with MS if stimulants are contraindicated in certain, certain situations. As goes to the cognitive difficulties and the executive dysfunction, ADHD, 
involves executive dysfunction, just like we talked about a minute ago. And sometimes it can, it can play out in MS as well. And behavioral non-pharmacological treatments for that are teaching someone what we call compensatory mechanisms for organizing their behavior. And it looks like we're running out of time, so I can't get detailed into what those are. But to know that a, a good, well-trained psychologist or neuropsychologist can help you compensate for your attentional weaknesses. We only have time for two more questions. One's going to be on that side, one's on this side. But I want to let you all know that for those that are leaving early, remember we need those seminar evaluations filled out, completed. You could leave them with Jill at the front entrance. She's at the table where you checked in. Okay, so remember we do need that. And before you all leave, or anybody does leave, I want to thank you for coming to today's program, which, by the way, when we were full house, there were 142 people here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much both doctors for coming this afternoon. I'm right over here up front. <laughs> um, my question is about biofeedback, because I know there are many different types of biofeedback, but when a doctor would say, oh, you need to go do biofeedback, but they don't give me any parameters of what type of biofeedback. I just went and I fell asleep or I laughed because I talked about another co co-worker that she always goes bananas at work and I'd always laugh and then I'd fall asleep with her because we never knew what we were supposed to be talking about for biofeedback. So what types of biofeedback are, are available? Biofeedback is an ever-expanding field. Good question. I'll tell you... Speak louder, please. I'll tell you uh, very briefly because I don't do a whole lot of the biofeedback Stuart mentioned earlier where you're getting hooked up to tons of different things to look at different functions. But um, the kind of biofeedback I've been involved in is looking at respiration rate and heart rate primarily and anxiety levels. And for any of you who don't know, biofeedback basically is your body emitting certain signals and you being able to see those signals in some form, visual, auditory, getting fed back to you. So it's almost like you're watching your own heart monitor or breathing rate, okay, on a screen. And one example of biofeedback treatment is a computer program where, let's say, uh, one that I use is a hot air balloon rises up. It's called EM wave. And it goes forward in some beautiful scenery with some beautiful music. The extent to which you can control your own breathing and heart rate and relaxation level overall, the balloon will go higher and faster because you're being hooked up to skin conductance and uh, a respiration monitor, and that information is being translated into the screen and the computer program, and the balloon is going according to your body rate. So what's happening is, as you watch the balloon doing well, and you're enjoying that, it's feeding back to your body that this is a good place for your body to be in. It's escaping your conscious control, really, of it, and just reinforcing whatever you're doing, calming, slowing your breathing, and you get it to go. Then when the balloon drops down, you, maybe you had a hiccup there or you started to breathe a little bit more faster and got anxious, and you know that's not good, so let me try to get my body back into that other state. And the balloon goes back up. After six or seven training sessions, half-hour training sessions of this, you begin to automatically dial your own, for lack of a better word, emotional temperature barometer down in accordance with relaxation. The other version that Stuart talked about is very similar. Just simple meditation and listening to your own body to calm it is really a, one form of biofeedback. Yeah. Okay, last question is from this side of the room and it's for Dr. Walker. Dr. Walker, is there a difference between cranberry pills versus cranberry juice to avoid UTIs? That's actually a very, very good question. So the cranberry juice versus the pills, the pills are more concentrated. And the theory, therefore, is you're trying to decrease the adherence of the bacteria to the uroepithelium. So if you can get the pills, I would say get the pills, versus you having to drink so much volume of cranberry juice, especially since you may have another issue with urinary urgency frequency. All right, so we want to thank Drs. Walker and Konitzer.